but the work speak for itself just doesn't work anymore for better or worse we live in a world where you want to do good things but also talk about it and this is really the essence that you do a great job but you also make sure the right people know about it not because you're driven by ego but because otherwise people will not realize it and everyone can take a first few steps and that means i have to be very clear about my personal narrative and what i stand for so i'm the man who i'm the woman who to be very clear who i am and what i want to be known for in my industry at least and the second part would be to message their clarity and make sure people hear about it and see it and whether it's on my linkedin profile whether it's in a speaking at an industry conference but those are the two steps you need to have that narrative clear and the story it's clear you want to tell so people understand what they should associate you with otherwise you would just lose out it's just the reality if, if you confuse you lose as it is often said you have to be visible for it otherwise if it's just in your head that's not going to help either the idea of job security is outdated as a landline if you haven't been in a search for a while it's probable you will at some point by choice or not most executives admit to staying way too long or sense what's coming and justify staying anyway. Here, there's another reason. The faulty belief that navigating to what's next will inevitably be worse and has to suck. Screw that. Lauren Greif has spent a lifetime in corporate and executive search, calling bullshit on stale career advice that most still use. This is Career Blast in a Half the career podcast for executives ready to cut past outdated career advice to fuel your outcomes now. So let's go. Have you ever noticed that CEOs have a very specific way of grabbing your attention and keeping it? It doesn't happen by accident. And our guest today, Oliver Oust, is one of the foremost leaders in how to speak like a CEO. We brought him on the show because he's worked with hundreds and hundreds of CEOs to help them master their message and deliver in a way that drives impact and also memorability. He is the best-selling author of two amazing books. Most recently is called Message Machine, and prior to that was Unignorable. And we are so honored, woohoo, delighted. I'm doing my you're not worthy wave <laughs> over here to have you here, Oliver. Thank you so much for joining and thank you for helping us all up level our, our presence and master our message. Well, Lauren, thank you very much for having me and for these very kind words. 100%. So what I want to just get into like right off the bat, because we're all about delivering value and making sure people have actionable steps is why would somebody want to speak like a CEO? Like, mm. I mean, we can say that, right? Like we can use a lot of the preconceived notions or just the pedigree of the title. But what is the, what is the reason behind somebody wants to be able yeah. to do that? Specifically for your audience, and there was a Harvard Business School study just two years ago, and they looked at American companies and the criteria under which they hire senior leaders, C-levels, and the number one criteria was social skills. They're looking for strong social skills to hire people for the C-suite. And among that, obviously, is communications. And the way I look at it is that communications is one of the three pillars of leadership. So as a leader, I need to understand, right? I need to understand what's going on in the world, what's going on in my industry and my business, I also need to be able to take good decisions, obviously based on my understanding of what's happening in the world. And the third pillar is communication. I can have the best strategy in the world if I can't convince my customers, my teams, my investors, my board to go with me on this journey. I'm on my own. And on my own, I can't really deliver against the strategy. So I will fail as a leader. And I think there has been a change, certainly the last 10 years or so, and certainly since COVID, that communications has become even more important as a lot of the sort of product side of what we used to call hard skills have been commoditized, are being taken over by AI and can be outsourced. So what really can't be commoditized and is therefore unique is your voice, your unique voice, your communication skills. Mm. Super important. It cannot be commoditized. That's right. And that is one area while, you know, AI is, you know, maybe all that in a bag of crisps or chips, depending on where you live. <laughs> Your voice is really the thing 
that can never be copied. It cannot be commoditized. And now the question is, what do you do with it? Yeah. And what are some of the biggest communication pitfalls that executives may not even know that they're, that they're facing in the process of either a career transition or even if they are in a job themselves? Because one of the things that I hear pretty much every client, every prospect that I talk to is they'll say, I want to have a seat at the table and I want to impact. So how yes. do those things connect? On your first point, AI, absolutely, AI commoditizes a lot of written communication. No doubt about that. What I'm referring to is your your spoken word, your voice, your unique story. AI doesn't know that. ChatGPT does not have your story usually. So to be precise, your unique voice and this connecting with other humans is what AI doesn't do at the moment. And that's really human strength. And I see it as an opportunity because we can let AI do the grunt work, but we can therefore spend more time and energy and headspace on really communicating and connecting at a human level. And this is what leaders, you know, strong leaders are really good at. It is often held that all great leaders are great communicators, and I do believe that is true. Now, what are the pitfalls? So there, there are some, to be sure. And the first one is not to take it seriously. And communicating, speaking, is something that comes natural to us as humans, right? So in a way, it is very easy to be mediocre, but it is quite mm. challenging to be really good. And often people are on this okay plateau where they think, oh, I'm actually quite a good communicator. I can present well, et cetera. And of course, that comes with years of practice. And most people in business are pretty decent at these things. But there's another level. There's the language of leadership where you can actually inspire people. And as you said, have a seat at the table and have an impact. And this is really what most leaders are looking for. Now, there are a number of pitfalls, and this is not by me, but this is by Julian Treasure. He held one of the top 10 TED Talks of all time, speaks to people who will listen, or words word to that effect. And he calls it the seven deadly sins of speaking. And one is gossip, there's judgmentalism, right? Mm. Negativity, complaining, exaggeration, excuses, and dogmatism. And I think the seven deadly sins really sum it up. There's a lot in there that we can unpack if you like, but I do think it's, it's a nice shortcut for us to understand that there are things that we really shouldn't engage in. And then there are other things like I'm holding a speech or holding a presentation. And because of 30 minutes, I start with 30 slides and that is a terrible idea. So we can dive into that as well and how I can actually engage with the audience and get them on my side rather than, you know, going through the motions like most people do. So out of the seven deadly sins, right? Cause there's a lot of them that, yeah. I mean, they're, they're rich, right? It, within yes. each one of them, which one is the most common or most prevalent that that we must, in your humble opinion, mm -hmm. really hone in on to to avoid. Yeah, I think it's judgmentalism because it comes so easy to us as humans. And I think most senior leaders understand it's not a good idea to gossip at the coffee machine or, you know, to 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 moan all the time about what's going on. You know, this is usually not behavior that, that leaders display in public. Give us an example of, of what that might sound like. Because to all to some yeah. degree right we're we're looking at leaders because they have an opinion yes. and they have a point of view and so i want to understand okay so yes. you're you're hired to be giving your pov and what's the difference between how it sounds from point of view or a recommendation or a suggestion yeah. versus a judgmentalism piece that could come out in a networking conversation. It could come out in an interview. If you're a leader and you are unaware of what that might look and feel like. Or yeah, something. It's, it's a great, it's a great question. I think the difference is that if it's judgmentalism, it's about the person. Mm -hmm. If it is, let's say, constructive criticism, my point of view, it would be about the question at hand, right? And that's where I would draw the line. And in terms of complaining and negativity, yes, absolutely right. I mean, managers tend to focus on problems. That's what we are paid to, to, to solve, right? So there is a degree of negativity baked into the job description. But I think the default should be one of, okay, let's resolve this rather than just 
highlighting the negative aspects of it. And this is, this is so crucial today because we know that four out of five businesses are currently engaged in some sort of transition process. And the other, other fifth is probably in denial because in reality, all companies are changing, right? And they're changing fast. And this will not change in the future because the future will look different. We don't know how, but change is a constant. We have to deal with it. So that is that makes communication so important even more important for leaders because they have to take people on this journey and that means they have to start with themselves they need to believe it in order to make others believe in it and that requires a high degree of positivity and optimism it can there can be skepticism in the mix for sure we want to be realists but if i'm negative if i'm complaining if i'm moaning i cannot take people with me on this transition that the business will need. And so how does that also translate when people are in their job search and there is a natural human wanting to vent, to be able to (laughs) show up in conversations and be authentic and real. And, and they might, they might unknowingly subliminally be sending those communication messages that may not necessarily be placing them in a in a solutions oriented space what do we do with our communication in that capacity it's a great question i mean i was i was in this situation myself so i worked for six years i worked my bones off for a big company a big airline in europe for six years and i loved my job but then there was a ceo change and as the chief communicator and sort of very close to the ceo essentially my days were numbered right usually when there's a new ceo they want to bring their own confidant for this particular role and i just saw the signs on the wall and it felt really bad because I, I've given this company my all for six years, and probably a lot of your listeners can relate to how that feels, right? And then you're dropped like a hot potato, essentially. So I resigned, held my head up high, but there was a lot of negativity and a lot of complaining on my side, but I did it in private, right? I did it in my kitchen and got it all out, right? Went for went for drinks with friends, et cetera. You have to let that steam out. I think that's that's really crucial. It can't be bottled up. But then when you go out and seek new opportunities, you want to leave that behind and focus on the opportunity in front of me. And what drove me at the at that time was the desire never to be in that situation again. I said, mm. no one will ever put me in that situation again. And for me, that was the driving force. And we probably all have these driving forces. And these situations that often you know, just just happen. They're just part of life. Life is a full contact sport and these things happen. And then I think it's it's seeing the opportunity in them to do something new and to do something different potentially. So I would say leave the negativity let the let the negativity out, but do it in private, not in when you seek new opportunities. And when you say private, you're talking about your personal life. How about in direct messages, chat channels, where potentially other people are in that in that area too is that considered private or or i I just want to understand some of the 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 areas of (laughs) yes i I would say that's private yeah i would say it's personal not private private is really in your kitchen that's okay. with your family. I think personal is when you send personal messages to each other at work. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't advise anyone to do it. I, I understand, obviously, that sometimes we have the impulse, but it's just a rule I follow to say I don't send negative messages to anyone in my team or to mm. to anyone, even though there are opportunities, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I would encourage everyone to think about that as well, because what do you gain, right? What, what What's really... Because what will happen is that you attract other people who may also be a bit negative and may also be in a difficult spot. And that's not really going to help us. What we want to do is attract and speak to people who have a positive outlook, who can help us because, you know, positivity, negativity, all of that is infectious. And I'd rather be among positive people and be positive myself. And we help each other and pull each other up rather than you know, misery seeks company. We've probably all heard that. So I don't think we want to be there. I don't think we have to be. It is completely normal that we have these feelings from time to time. Let's let them all out, but in the right forum. Okay. Keep it in the kitchen. Yeah. Keep it in the kitchen. Keep it in the kitchen. That's your next book. (laughs) So (laughs) one of the things that, and I love this idea of unignorable from your, from your, your first book 
What does unignorable mean? What does it mean? I mean, I know what it means on the surface, but now what I really want to know is what are the key one or two areas that you would say overarchingly, here is your 80-20. If you do this, Mm -hmm. you're essentially able to leverage a level of unignorability. And part of that is collapsed into the communication of you as a CEO or C-suite or, or a leader. Yeah. What are those, what is that big chunk? Yeah, so I don't know, but the, the, the title was inspired by a Steve Martin quote, be so good they can't ignore you. And to me, this signifies a shift from the old world where maybe we could say, let the work speak for itself. And mm. let the work speak for itself just doesn't work anymore, you know, for, for better or worse. We live in a world where you want to do good things, but also talk about it. And this is really the essence that you do a great job, but you also make sure the right people know about it. Not because you're driven by ego, but because it's the right thing to do and also the right thing maybe for your team and you know your family and the wider context, because otherwise people will not realize it. And for me, there are probably nine steps to come to start as a business leader and become a thought leader. And I realize not everyone needs to be a thought leader. Not every CEO even needs to be a thought leader. Not at all. But some have that inclination. Yet everyone can take a first few steps. And that means I have to be very clear about my personal narrative and what I stand for. So I'm the man who, I'm the woman who, to be very clear who I am and what I want to be known for in my industry, at least. And the second part would be and make sure people hear about it and see it. And whether it's on my LinkedIn profile, whether it's in uh, speaking at an industry conference, but those are the two steps and we can obviously go deeper, but you need to have that narrative clear and the story's clear you want to tell so people understand what they should associate with. Otherwise, if you're not clear, no one else will be clear. And if you're not clear, you would just lose out. It's just the reality. If you, if you, you know, if you confuse, you lose, as it is often said. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you have to be visible for it. Otherwise, if it's just in your head, that's not going to help either. I'm so glad that you invited me into this piece of this conversation because I was moving over to leadership narratives, which is essentially a more fancy way of saying your story. A lot of folks struggle with telling their story. And my question back to you is, what has changed in the whole idea of, I need to tell my story, help me put my value proposition together. You know, whatever the kind of catchphrase is for that, what has changed from where it used to be? You're saying everybody's changing, that area of disruption is changing. And part of what I understand in in the world is that not all messages or not all value propositions are, are necessarily heard or unignorable. So what has changed and what, what must we focus on in, in that very short window, whether it's through networking yeah. or in an interview, what has to be included there and what, what can we do to drive that impact? Yeah, what has changed? I think it has always been very important. Back to, in the ancient days, you know, the leaders were great communicators. They were great storytellers. They were great speechwriters, right? I think in the 20th century, you lost some of that because the, the era of big organizations was very technocratic and there wasn't a lot of room for individualism and for storytelling in a way because it was seen as maybe stepping out of the fold. And now in the last few years, what we've seen is a high degree of individualization partly due to social media, partly due to the fact that the age of big organizations has passed to some extent. We see a lot of very small but very agile startups and small companies, solopreneurs, and they obviously have a stronger impetus to look at their story, look at the narrative than someone who works in a company with 200,000 employees. So I think that's that's what's driving this. And I welcome it because I think it's it's almost like going back to the good old days, but just that we have LinkedIn now and and podcasts and are no longer reliant on basically a, you know, a soapbox and and standing in the park and, and shouting from the rooftop. So in a way, I think that's that's a good development. What should be in that? You already alluded to the fact you don't have a lot of time. So in a way, it needs to be very snappy. It needs to be very short. And 
sometimes people struggle a little bit with crafting that. So I would invite you to imagine that your narrative is a bit of a house, right? Let's call it a messaging house. And at the top, you have the roof where you have your key message. So that's the one thing you want everyone to know about you. In a way, maybe that's the line under LinkedIn. You know, there's a line where you can describe yourself and maybe that's what you put there. So that's probably the roof, the key message. And underneath, maybe the the roof rests on three pillars. So maybe you have three messages underneath. And that can be that what you do is great for you know for the individual is great for the company and it's great for society so the rule of three kicks in here but very simply if you have three messages to underpin your overarching narrative the key message that's very helpful and the foundation is that's that's all your proof points so if you claim to be a leader in this industry what are your proof points what do you have to show for that's why i see the stories the killer facts the anecdotes the examples the case studies so that's the foundation and I think what we often see is that people go in with a foundation, you know, I've done this and I've done that and these are my achievements, which is fantastic, but it shouldn't be the starting point. To me, the starting point is the roof, the key message, and then the three pillars, and then you can dive deeper and give people proof. So this is critical. And I, I think it's also funny because you <laughs> talked about how storytelling is coming back. Of course, storytelling really never left <laughs> because we're, <laughs> we are driven yes. and and keyed into stories. Stories are memorable. And in a leadership narrative, what's different for the listener? What's different for the listener? Should I say something like, hey, you know, I'm an executive with 20 years of proven experience and I have, you know, I specialize in this, this, this versus I'm so-and-so and so-and-so and and I convert go-to-market strategies into 10x types of you know revenue drivers what what changes for the people behind there what is the impact of this because a lot of what some people think is storytelling it's hard to be able to to assess it yourself because yeah. if you don't know how it's going to land it's hard to know how to address it that's very true i think the difference is that the better stories, they start with the audience. They think about the audience, what the audience is interested in. And obviously your audience has a specific, often a specific objective in mind, namely to be in a position to pursue an opportunity, say. And that means they and everyone else who tells the story should start with the audience rather than starting with yourself. It's not inside out, it's outside in. What's the audience interested in? And then you think, okay, what can I deliver? And then you look at the what's the overlap, so to speak, right? So what interests the audience? What can I deliver that meets the this interest? And how can I craft a narrative out of that? Now, concretely, as you said, uh, maybe not so convincing narratives. I have 20 years of experience and I've done this and I worked at that company and I spent three years in Singapore and so on. That sounds like a CV. It's not a story. It's not a narrative, right? But if you take it one level higher, we're going to the roof now. So I'm a proven executive and I have 20 years experience in, you know, I'm a proven leader when it comes to successful transitions in multinational environments. Like, and then I maybe refer back to the company that I'm speaking with and say, you know, like yourself, and I've been in these situations. And then the other side will be much more interested and inclined to listen to what else you have to say because you immediately link it to their interest. And I always think, what question does the person have who's in front of me? And, and it'll be a good fit, right? They're spending time, they invited you, so they want this to be a good fit. And I think if you start by answering their questions in a way through stories, then you're off to a good start. Mm. Mm-hmm. I really like that too. What is the future looking like? What is what is in your books, in a lot of the conversations, what is the future of speaking like a CEO? How do we take this episode and bring this into right here and now and then start using this these insights to drive us forward? Yeah. I think the future is driven by creator CEOs, social CEOs who are very active. They're active communicators. And the difference to previous generations is that they're very media savvy, tech savvy. They want to communicate. They are in these positions because they are strong communicators and they do not expect someone else to write it all for them, but they have their own ideas and their own take and they know they have to communicate and protect their own voice. 
because we're in this age of AI, we're seeing a lot of content being put out. It's very samey. So average is over in that respect. And you really want a com- strong, be a strong communicator. And as a business, you want to have a really strong communicator at the helm because that will attract people to work with you. So for employer branding, it's essential now. It is mm-hmm. essential to attract customers because content in a way is the new sales. Mm-hmm. People don't want to sit on sales calls. They want to watch content or see content and take their own decision and only then reach out themselves so the sales process has shifted towards essentially pre-selling content communication a visible ceo so for the sake of the business a ceo who's a strong communicator and ideally has a strong reputation slash personal brand to the outside world and is a strong communicator internally because we are in all these transitions and can take people with him or her that is what people are looking for right now and i think this trend will extend into the into the future Hmm. So where where your voice is seen, heard, and supported within your digital footprint, right? Yes. And, and trust. I like what yeah. I like what you said about CEOs are savvy creators. And there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of noise or 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 support around, well, I don't know if I wanna, you know, say anything on LinkedIn or you know, I, I'm just going to park my profile here and, and, and let it do all the heavy lifting. And I know for many of the folks that we have worked with at Portfolio Rocket, this is a winning strategy. Yeah, like they are exactly. blown away, literally like, oh my God, I can't believe it. It took me a, a little while. I, I, I wasn't comfortable at first. But then, you know, I took a couple baby steps and before you knew it, it was like, where did this person find me in the comments and all that good stuff? So talk more if you can about the piece around what is eligible for thought leadership, because a lot of people think I need to go write a white paper. I need to like this needs to be like this, like really heady, intellectual, professional thing. And so I'm curious where where the lines are and what what is what do CEOs what are they attracted to what are people who are recruiting and or hiring for these roles what deems as thought leadership Yeah Great question I think it's first of all you have to have great ideas right I think thought leadership is obviously means standing out thinking ahead into the future because most people in an industry tend to focus on the short term right the quarterly numbers maybe the end results for sure but there are a few people in each industry and they can be at different levels right it doesn't always have to be the CEO it can be at different levels they think further ahead they are thinking about the impact of AI in three years they're thinking about okay what does the geopolitical instability mean for our supply chains and our industries so it can be quite focused on an industry and usually is and it doesn't mean i have to have a huge audience it means i have the right audience and you've heard the a thousand true fans now for thought leader it may be you know it may not be fans but that means the recognition may be by a thousand important people in the industry and that can come through content it come through podcasts speaking at events it can be a book you write it can be a white paper i'm less focused on the channel and more focused on the strength of the idea and when i work with ceos it's always i I always listen what channels do they like what what do they prefer and some like to speak to the media some like to be on stages podcasts etc and i think the strategy needs to fit the person not the other way around sure Mm -hmm. linkedin is is a given these days you need to have a presence there because everyone who's applying for your company wants to take a look at the ceo on linkedin that's that's just how it is but but in general you want to pursue the the the, the channels and opportunities that suit you some people love inf- being in front of a camera and others hate it and i wouldn't drag someone in front of a camera who hates it at least not in the first instance but start right. off with things they like so if you like to write or if you like to speak you know pursue these opportunities podcasts content written content videos etc so listen to your inner to your inner driver, your inner CEO, and pick your strategy accordingly. Find it, find and and share your great ideas. Right? Yes, share so, it, share it, and share don't your be shy, great right? Share yeah. your great ideas. Don't keep them all like locked up yeah. in here for us to come knocking, right? Exactly. Share them so that we can <laughs> we can actually experience you. And and you did you kind of like slid it in there, but I think this is super important, right? Yeah. This is this is a trust builder. This trust really, builder. 
Yes. This is a huge trust builder. Can you say more about that? Like, I mean, everyone asks, asks this question, how long does it take to build trust? And <laughs> I know that, you know, you were in a very trusted role if you were in the C-suite. People are trusting yeah. you with so much, your company, your P&Ls, yeah. your employees, real lives. So how do you do this so that the trust is layering and accumulating in the right direction? Yeah, that's right. And trust is low these days. Trust in organizations in general, whether political, whether they're businesses, whether they're media, we all know, we see this, right? Trust is relatively low. And that is bad for society, but it's also an opportunity for individuals and organizations that manage to build trust. And a lot of brands that are very valuable have managed to do that. So how? Let's talk about a, a person, right? It can be C-suite, can be middle management, but how do you build trust? Trust has three components. The first one is competence. So you need to be good at what you do. Otherwise, people don't trust you. If you're, if you were, you know, call a plumber, you wouldn't trust that plumber and to, unless they're a really good plumber, right? So competence is a, is a, clearly is a given. Second one is integrity. If if you lie or bend the truth or are not transparent, which is probably more likely in business, you're just withholding information for whatever reason, you're not going to build trust. So you need to be transparent about what you know, and what you don't know. And I think this is easier now because no one expects anyone to know everything anymore. We don't, we don't know what the future will bring. So people are looking for trust more than maybe that deep knowledge or insightfulness about the future because who can claim to have that? So it's competence, it's integrity. And the third factor is benevolence. I need to look for win-win situations, right? Mm -hmm. So I can be competent and, and not lie and tell the truth, but if I'm only in it for myself, people will not trust me. So I need to show and tell that I have your best interest at heart and your can be the whole team, can be the whole business. So if I'm good at what I do, if I'm transparent in my communication and I really have my team's best interest at heart, then I can build trust. And it takes time. And as often said, it is, it is gained in drops and lost in buckets. So you know, one mishap will probably lose you quite a bit of trust. But if you, if you do this over time, then trust will build because people want to trust their leaders, right? They're looking for, they're looking for trustful people in their business environment. They don't, they want to want these important relationships in their life to, to work. And that includes having a leader they can trust. I just want to kind of backtrack for a minute because I heard something that you said trust is relatively low. Explain yes. more about that. Mm. I, so, mm. I equate it, I equate trust is high to how long the hiring process is taking. So I would love to hear how this is really, why, why you're seeing trust is low and what the opportunity really, really is, you know, in, in concert with some of these, yeah. this three-legged stool that you shared. Yeah, it's a, absolutely. So there are trust barometers that measure trust year by year of a long period of time, many different countries in the world. And they have indicated in recent years that overall trust in institutions, business, government, media is relatively low. And I think one of the reasons why you see so many co companies being so present on social media and CEOs being so active is to counter that. They see the opportunity that maybe in general business, trust in businesses is not very high, but we could stand out here. There's a real mm. opportunity. Now, as you know, only 1% of creators on LinkedIn post every week. And the same is true for businesses, a lot of especially smaller businesses. They, they're not really visible. And we can't really build trust with an organization or person that, that is not visible. And that's why I think the opportunity is to be visible and display these three pillars of integrity, benevolence, and competence. And people will crave that level of trust that you provide. And podcasts are obviously a fantastic way to achieve that because you can actually listen to someone's voice or see the video and that helps us build trust more or quicker than written content can for instance so okay so oliver i want to challenge you is the barrier of trust low but the value of trust high the value of trust is higher right the overall level of trust is lower but these are obviously inversely correlated mm. so if there's less trust to go around then if i have it that's more valuable Okay. Now I'm, now I'm, I, I'm with you. Oof. I'm glad that we got that out of the way. Cause I was like, wow, how could people not be so trusting and, or so easily trusting? 
and that that helps a lot. So we're going to turn this conversation over to our signature questions. I'm going to ask you three questions and just, I mean, have fun with these. You sure. know, you're, you're a fun guy. And I mean, let's, let's be honest, you're getting married this weekend. So, I mean, you're, you're ready yes. to celebrate, right? This Absolutely. is all great. Absolutely. I can't, I'll I'm take so excited for you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So here Thank I you, am, Lord. like, I'm, I'm like simulating right now. I'm mm-hmm. pretending that I'm either on a networking call or an interview. And what I want to know is what should the, my post-it be to be able to deliver an unignorable message and speak like a CEO. What is that quick reminder? Yeah, it's emotion, fact, emotion. So you start off with the emotion because you want to capture, you want to connect with the person on the other line or on the conference call. Then you want to give the facts because we can't just convince based on emotions alone. And then you want to conclude with something that's connecting and emotional again. So Mm -hmm. that's what I will put on the post-it. If it's emotions, facts, emotions, E-F-E. All right, you yes, got the sandwich, yeah, guys. I mean, like this is this is really really good. Yeah. And this so. is this is where often the disconnect between speaker and the audience comes from. The speaker has thought about the issue and the, the the presentation a lot, which means that they are very much on the rational side, right? They've been through all the emotional stages, but they're very rational. But the audience who's not aware of this, they start out on the instinctive and then emotional side. So that's where the disconnect often comes from. Hence, you want to start with something instinctive, emotional, where you can connect before you deliver the facts, and then you obviously bring it home with the emotions okay. again. Now, now I'm going to have you. I'm going to have you do this so pretend that we're just like starting this and uh, you're you're the interviewee and i'm the interviewer so here we are what would you say as your efe sandwich how would you kick it off right so i'm the interviewer the interviewee the interviewee i'm the interviewee okay understood yeah and you asking me a question and i great to meet you myself. oliver um, great to meet excited, you, excited for this interview i'm, I'm very excited to um i'm a real fan of your company i really love the product and i i'm a user myself so i regularly purchase it and i have to say doing a great job which is exactly why i wanted to apply for this position and i do believe i would be a suitable candidate i would fill this role not just because i'm passionate about the product and the industry but also because i'm a true leader i'm a recognized leader and have been for 20 years in this industry and my results in my previous role have been to be honest, quite outstanding. And we doubled our sales in the last three years, which is why I believe it is now time for a new role, a new challenge for me. Also, because I would really, really enjoy working with you and working with the others in the leadership team who I already had the pleasure of meeting. Mm. All right. So this is like putting yourself out there, right? You're, you're, right. you're clear, right? You're, you're clear, you know, the product and you know, I, I would also probably rave about the specific features and benefits of that product Absolutely. too, because I'm a big fan of specificity. And yes. Because a lot of those other things can sometimes fall as trite or insincere because they're used to hearing that. I mean, if you're, if you're a sexy brand, everybody wants a piece of you. So I would yes. love to, love to let's like throw that <laughs> into the sauce. Totally. Great. Second question is, Aside from your wonderful books, what are your other go-tos that people should either listen to as podcasts or read to stay up to speed on how to really up-level their impact communication and speak along the lines of a CEO? Yeah, yeah. in addition to my own podcast, Speak Like a CEO, Please. there is just a you know shameless plug, but there is, of course, Matt Abraham's podcast. He's at Stanford. He's a prophet at Stanford, and his podcast is called Think Fast, Talk Fast. Sorry. Think fast, talk smart. It is excellent. It is an excellent resource, and uh, he has a really, really fantastic guest. So, that's in addition to my own podcast. I would, I would name that one. In terms of books, I would recommend when you want to work on your voice, for instance, Caroline Goider's book, Find Your Voice. I think that's that's an excellent resource, and there is there are a number of good books on storytelling. I like Donald Miller's book about storytelling, the Story Brand, and their story. 10x by michael who's been on the podcast a couple of times earlier this year so i really like that book as well so i I would look at books that cover storytelling i would look at books that cover public speaking you know find your voice by caroline's for instance i don't think 
that you want to look for one book on communication skills in general. I think this there it's a skill set. So I would look for specific books for specific skills. But those are probably a few that come to mind. And in terms of persuasion, I still think that Influence by Robert Cardini is, is a fantastic book. And Jonah Berger's books I would also recommend. The last one is called Magic Words. And mm-hmm. it shows the power of language in a very a scientific but also very entertaining way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all great suggestions. I, I thank you for over delivering and building our library. The last <laughs> question is: What is your walk-up song? Or in this case, I'm gonna like let you pick any song that you're gonna be dancing to at your wedding this weekend. Oh, thank you. So at the wedding, it will be sunny, but for uh, for wake up, I needed something a bit more energetic, and I like a song that's called "Don't Upset the Rhythm" by the Nozettes. Mm. and that song is a great line it's a, it's a few years old but it's a great line it says, it says go baby go it all comes down to action and mm. that's the line that resonates in the morning it all comes down to action oh you feel it's a sunny day it's a rainy day it comes down to action so go baby go it also it also just shows you that my communication skills are not that good because i said walk up song and you heard <laughs> wake up song so we're gonna go with that because that's well, perfect so go, baby yeah, go. That's, go baby go Oliver asked, we will make sure that we include all of the links for your books, your podcast, and of course, your LinkedIn profile, how to speak like a CEO. You absolutely knocked it out of the park today. Thank you so much. And please follow Oliver for more good tips. He's got an amazing newsletter as well. So we want to definitely shout that out. And if you love this episode, and how could you not, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel and help us continue growing and write a podcast review. Help us out here. We love, 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 love to deliver value. And we would appreciate that so much. So signing off today. And thank you, Oliver, again, for helping us all be unignorable and master our message with our message machines. Mm -hmm. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for joining today. We appreciate your listening ears. Big time. We ask this. Use these tools, not tomorrow, right now, and share them by spreading the love, leaving us a rating and subscribe so you don't miss the next career blast in a half. Most of all, thank you for you.